Now we can start with our first submission and with first submitted paper, which is from uh, Felipe Morera, Degradation Semantics for Divine and Secular Rebaptism. Is uh, Felipe here? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Um, Thanks. As well. I mean, I mean, I wrote a lot about Nietzsche in the past, but my talk is going to be very, <laughs> very unconnected with the last one. Uh, so let me let me share here my screen. So first of all, thank you for giving me this chance of presenting this new research of mine. So the title of my talk is Degradation Semantics for Divine and Secular Rebutism. And I would like to start by talking about two passages from the book of Genesis. So the first one is, is the one in which Elohim, which is one of the names of God in, in the Old Testament, another name is Yahweh. I'm not going to talk much about the names of God, but given that I'm talking about proper names, I think I, I need to mention this. So Elohim states to Abram the following. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. And a few passages below on Genesis 17, 15, Elohim is now addressing the man that he just rebaptized, Abraham. And he says, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. So rebatism, in the sense I'm applying the term here, is a phenomenon that takes place when a person who was first baptized with a proper name is later renamed with a distinct proper name. So Abram is rebaptized Abraham and Sarai is rebaptized Sarah. Those are two examples of rebatism. But more precisely speaking, the, the two rebatisms that take place in, in those passages I just mentioned in, in the book of Genesis are divine ones. And so by a divine rebatism, I mean one that is performed or allegedly performed by, by a deity. And, and the, the disjunction here, the second part of the disjunction allegedly performed is important because, well, insofar as I'm concerned, um, the, the points made in the last talk can all, can all be the case that maybe there is no God. And so far as I'm concerned, this is, it doesn't really matter. It may be just uh, an alleged God. And, and the, the, what matters here is that there is uh, a distinction between the divine rebatism and the secular rebatism. And secular rebatism is one that is performed by an ordinary person or institution. So some examples of this phenomenon are the rebatism of Malcolm Little into Malcolm X, the rebatism of Cassius Clay into Muhammad Ali, the rebatism of Otto Adolf Eichmann, uh, who was a, a former Nazi officer, is the one that Hannah Arendt wrote a whole book about it, the, the Eichmann case. So, the, so his rebatism into, into Ricardo Clement is another example. And the more recent one um, of Bruce Jenner into Caitlyn Jenner is also an example of, of secular rebatism. So rebatism, I think, um, is a point of intersection of two apparently unrelated bodies of works. On the one hand, you have the works articulated by the specialists on, on the Old Testament, especially on the portraits of Abraham, Abraham and Sarai, Sarah, such as Thomas, Thomas Holman. I'm writing a paper about this, and, and this, this, he's a specialist in the Old Testament. It was very important, the things he, he was saying for my, for my own views. He works at the College of Funds and, and, and has, a lot of, has written a lot about this. And on the other hand, you have the works of the philosophers of language on the semantics of proper, lang of proper names. And the most important one for the purpose of this talk Probably the most famous one is, is so creepy. So my aim in this talk is going to be to dialogue with those two bodies of works 
by providing a semantics for proper names that accounts for both kinds of ribotism. So my main opponent here is humanism, which is a view that is usually attributed to Kripke. So uh, Anders Schubay claims that Kripke is committed to the thesis that proper names have five properties. And I'm going to take this for granted. I'm not really interested in the exegetical dispute on what's the best way to read Kripke. I'm, I'm just going to take for granted that this is how he's supposed to be uh, read. So first of all, proper names, such as all the ones I mentioned, they would be meaningless, which is to say they wouldn't stand for definite descriptions. Uh, the, they would only contribute with a reference to, to, the, to the semantic content, uh, to the semantic content of the statement which they are part of, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't contribute with a meaning. So, for instance, the term Abram wouldn't mean a definite description or wouldn't stand as, wouldn't stand for a disguised definite description such as um, a great father. They, they would be there would be no meaning attached there, according to Kripke. So therefore, uh, names proper names. Every time I mention names, I'm, I'm going to have proper names in my mind. Uh, proper names would be directly referential, which is to say, they would grasp their possible or actual references without the mediation of any meaning. Any any a definite description without this mediation, like, like against what Frigg is said, this is what Kripke is defending here in, in in holding that proper names are direct referential. So the third property is that proper names would be rigid. So a proper name is rigid, and this is Kripke's definition. A proper name is rigid if and only if it designates the same individual in all possible worlds in which the individual exists and does not designate anything else. So let us assume for the sake of argument that there was such a man called Abraham. So in all possible worlds in which this individual um, existed, the proper name would, would refer, the proper name Abraham would refer to him if, if this proper name is rigid. Like even in possible worlds in which Abraham didn't do the things the Bible is saying that he did. So proper names will also be fixed, which is to say um, the reference of those names wouldn't shift if the name were to be placed before a logical operator, such as a temporal operator before, for instance, a temporal operator could be before or after the rebatism of Abraham into Abraham. Uh, if you place the, the proper name Abraham or the proper name Abraham, after this operator, this reference wouldn't, wouldn't shift. It would remain the same. And finally, proper names would be lexically ambiguous. So if you think about the name Paul, Paul, according to Kripke, is a lexically ambiguous name because uh, this, this phonological string Paul could either be part of the proper name Paul Selam, the, the poet, or, 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 the, or the proper name Paul McCartney, the, the Beatle. Right. So, uh, can, can you still hear me? Yes. Ah, okay, okay. Because I'm just I'm just uh, seeing the screen, so I don't have any interactions. I just need to make sure I'm not talking alone. Uh, thanks. Uh, so the the first thesis I'm gonna try to briefly back up here is that the genesis use of proper names in describing those two divine rebatism I just mentioned counter-exemplifies minimalism, which is to say Abraham and Abraham and Sarah and Sarah, they do not have those five properties that you see there in the screen. Uh, so they are not meaningless, they're not directly referential, they're not rigid, they're not fixed, they're not lexically ambiguous in the context of the Genesis. So my second thesis is that although this, this may pose a quite minor problem for minimalism for reasons I'm gonna explain soon, um, I don't think the same is the case with secular ribotism. So in other words, secular ribotism does pose a quite uh, pressing, pressing problem for, for the, the, the ones that accept millionism, okay? And my third thesis is, is that millionism provides a less appealing view 
on those two kinds of rheumatism, the divine one and the secular one, then what I'm gonna call a gradation semantics, which is what I'm proposing, which is supposed to be the, the new thing that I'm, that I'm doing. So the gradation semantics is basically the thesis that proper names have those five properties, but in distinct degrees. Uh, they have, uh, uh, it comes in degrees and in, in those degrees vary from the context of application from context of application, which is to say in certain contexts, proper name can be more meaningful than in other contexts. And the same thing applies to the other properties. It can be more or less direct referential, but more or less rigid, more or less fixed and more or less lexically ambiguous. So why should you follow me in believing thesis one? So this is one, again, the genesis use of proper names in describing divine rebatism counter exemplifies Milonism. My core reason is basically uh, textual evidence. I think it's very hard to make sense of the Bible if you assume Milonism. It, it, it doesn't seem that this is what's occurring in that piece of text. So, Consider again those examples, right? Abraham, the, the rebatism of Abraham into Abraham and the rebatism of Sarai into Sarah. I think that the most plausible reading of those passages I mentioned, but all, all the ones that concern uh, Abraham and Sarah, is that those names, they do have a meaning, is a, is a quite complex one, in the sense that each one of those names it stands for an abbreviation of a very complex conjunction of definite descriptions. So, for instance, Abram means an exalted father. It's an abbreviation of an X such that X is an exalted father. It's an abbreviation of this uh, um, definite description. Um, it, it also is also part of the meaning of Abram and other, several other uh, definite descriptions, such as um, being someone who is married to a bearing woman, being someone who has a kid with a slave, Agar, and so on. So Abraham, on the other hand, it, it, it has a distinct meaning. Like he's, first of all, it means that he's a father of a multitude. He's, he's a superior father vis-a-vis -vis an exalted father. He's another description that he's more godlike. He's, he's a prophet that, that fulfills God's will much more intensively than Abraham. This is why he has a new covenant with, with God, like with Elohim. Um, and and he's, he's the father of Isaac, too, because when God rebaptized Abraham into Abraham, and when he rebaptized Sarah into Sarah, into Sarah, Sarah becomes fertile, and then they give, she gives birth to, to Isaac. And, and so when it comes to Sarai and Sarah, I think the same thing, same thing applies. Um, Sarai is used in the sense... Uh, of uh, abbreviation of a very complex definite conjunction of definite descriptions that includes to be a bearing woman, uh, to have allowed Abraham to sleep with a slave in order for Abraham to feel better uh, about, about himself, about the fact that he was childless, and so on. And, and another, another thing that is important to, to associate with Sarah is that she left uh, of God. This is an important passage on the Bible. She left a God because uh, God tells her that she she will give birth to a kid, and, yeah. and then now when God tells this to, to Sarai, according to the Bible, uh, she's she's 90 years old, and so she laughs. And uh, so when when God turns Sarai into Sarah, she no longer laughs of God. So she you know, now she's a fertile woman. Now she's the mother of Isaac. There are all kinds of distinct definite descriptions, which is to say, I think if you don't attribute meaning to those terms, it's very hard to make sense of the transition of the, of the divine river terms that described in the, in the book of Genesis. So given that this, these terms, these proper names are meaningful, I think that they are indirect referential. So they refer to the mediation of those very complex conjunctions of definite descriptions. So given so, they are non-rigid. They only refer to, to the individuals that would fulfill those very restrict conditions that uh, that the Bible is associating with them. And so they would not be fixed either, because if you if you put the, the temporal operator before or, or after the rebatism of Abraham into Abraham, the 
the reference of, of the proper name Abraham, as well as the reference of the term Abraham, will shift. And they're not lexically ambiguous in the context of the Genesis, because uh, there is only one Abraham in that context. There is only one Sarah in that context. So um, I think that the Genesis is uh, a text, it gives us a textual evidence of a highly meaningful concept of application of the proper names Abraham, Abraham, Sarah, and Sarah. Maybe I could uh, develop this into several other proper names of the Bible, but for the sake of the talk, I just want to talk about those, those four ones. So my second thesis is that, look, you might claim that this poses a quite minor problem for Melodism because after all, Kripke was not interested in making sense of the Bible. It's not something that he, he was uh, aiming to do. So uh, why would this be a problem for him? Especially considering that the text of the Genesis is a quite unique text, is a quite technical use of language. It's comparable to, to a literary, to other literary works, like Grand Sertão Veredas, for instance, or Guimarães Rosa. It, it has a super particular way of using proper names. So why would Melianism have to make sense of this? I, I do believe that this is an interesting objection you could raise against me. Uh, and I do grant that, okay, the use of language in the Genesis is quite alternative, but the same is not the case with secular rebutism. Secular rebutism is a, is a phenomenon that takes place in ordinary life quite recurrent and quite recurrently. And, and, and this poses a problem for millions because it's a, it's a phenomenon that takes place when people are using proper names in an ordinary way. So I have a simple argument to back this view up, but before I tell you what argument is that, just let me emphasize here that there is no dispute between me and, and the millionist in so far as psychological justifications for rebutism are at stake. So a psychological justification for, for rebutism would, would take place if, for instance, if you think about Malcolm Little and, and or Malcolm X, the man who used to be called Malcolm Little and then Malcolm X. Uh, a psychological justification would be something along the lines uh, I don't like the way this term Malcolm Little sounds. It's just not something that I'm particularly fond of. And, and it would be very idiosyncratic. It would be very particular to, to Malcolm X himself. It would be associated with what Frege calls ideas, psychological ideas. Um, I grant that several rebutisms, they may be justified or at least properly justified by means of psychological justifications, but Psychological justifications are not the whole story. So here's the argument. Like, if proper names are usually meaningless, usually, okay, beyond the Bible, it's in ordinary life, according to Kripke. If they are usually meaningless, as Millionism argues, they are usually, there are usually no social justifications apprehensible by a community for rebutism. And what I mean by a social justification is one that is apprehensible for people in the community. People in the community understand that Malcolm Little doesn't mean Malcolm X. This is why it's a social justification. Uh, it's same thing with Bruce Jenner and Caitlyn Jenner. People understand it's not a, merely a, an idea, an idiosyncratic thing. When you change your name from a proper name, usually associated with males, to a proper name, usually associated with females, uh, others who are part of the community understand this. And this is a social justification. So premise two is that there usually are social justifications for rebutism. So therefore, by modus tollens, it's not the case that proper names are usually meaningless. So for instance, if you think about the context of the Nation of Islam, which is a, is a political organization, religious a political organization that Malcolm X was part of in the 50s and 60s, uh, I take that this is a quite meaningful context of application. So for the people there, everybody there, or at least most members of, of that community would understand that Malcolm Little, for people like Malcolm X, means uh, a, a name given by, by a slave owner to a, to a slave. So it's, it's the name of someone who doesn't know who, who one is. And Malcolm X is the name of someone who knows that his ancestors were kidnapped from Africa and, and someone who knows that uh, one's identity was lost because of this kidnapping. And so it's, it's, it's politically important to make this, this rebutism and, and, and it's a social justification, not merely a psychological one. So outside the context of Islam, you might, you might think uh, like the proper names Malcolm Little and Malcolm X, and the same thing applies to the other names. 
I don't think they are totally meaningless. There is always some kind of meaning attached to them, but they are not as specific as the meaning they would have in those more um, um, contexts in which people are specialists, so to speak. But I think that any speaker of English can understand, for instance, that Cassius Clay is an ordinary American name, and Muhammad Ali sounds like a Islamic like uh, name. And the same thing applies to Eichmann and Ricardo Clement. Like so, Eichmann uh, sounds, especially in the context of the 1950s or late 40s in Argentina, to, to where Eichmann went uh, went to live. Uh, it sounds is a is a German like is a much more German like name. It's almost a sound. It sounds almost like a Nazi-like game, as opposed to name, sorry, as opposed to Ricardo, which is a much more Latin name, right? So what follows from what I'm saying is that millennialism provides a less appealing view on divine and sacral liberalism than degradation semantics, because degradation semantics is gonna is gonna make sense of those cases by, by considering that uh, it's gonna vary from context to context. In certain contexts, the names are gonna be highly meaningful. Or, an, or highly direct referential, or highly fixed, or highly uh, rigid, or highly lexically ambiguous, and others they won't. So I ran out of time because to summarize what I want to say, I basically tried to very briefly back up criticism. The first was the genesis of proper names in describing divine rebatism, the contrary exemplifies millionism. The second one is that although divine rebatism may pose a minor problem for millionism, the same is not the case with secular rebatism and millionism. This my third thesis provides a less appealing view on divine and secular rebatism than aggradation semantics. That's that's it. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Felipe. And thank you very much. Been an interesting talk. And so uh, okay, I see there are questions, but we will go the So uh, questions first. Please raise your hand that you can write. Uh, uh, your question in the chat. Don't be shy. Either in English or Portuguese. Okay, we have a first question, Irene. Hi. Uh, <laughs> so thank you for the interesting talk. I was I was thinking um, there is I mean if you if you can um, uh, I, I'm thinking about the the slide in which you talk about uh, the fact that, that uh, the, the, there is no the, uh, there are some types uh, of proper names who are in uh, indirectly referential and so um, uh, so my question is like um, uh, so the, those those definite descriptions uh, are you sure they wouldn't be uh, somehow, and uh, sorry, it's not in that. Uh, it's not only indirect references, but also non-fixed. Does does proper names? Does uh, descriptions would would? Are you sure you wouldn't? They wouldn't be fixed in all possible words. Like, are you sure you can conceive that really? I don't know the the father of the of uh, Judaism. He wouldn't be the same person in all possible words. Yeah. Yeah, this uh, it's a more it's um it's very hard to answer this quickly because it's like ten minutes to solve this issue. But quickly speaking, I would say that um, the Abraham, in order for him to be what he is in the Bible, he needs to fulfill all those requirements. If 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 the man uh, the, the 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 intuition I have is very anti Kripkean, right? Krip keeps pointing to the intuition. Look, if Abraham, let us assume that Abraham existed, but he didn't do the things that he did in the Bible. Like he 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 wasn't married to Sarah, he wasn't rebaptized by God, he didn't become the father of Judaism and all that. And um, in this case, in this possible world, according to Kripke, he would still be Abraham. Right, the core intuition that I'm pointing. No, in this case, he wouldn't be Abraham because what makes him be Abraham, what makes him be unique, like to even to speak in a more Nietzschean way, what make he became what he was because he did all those things. So in those other worlds in which he doesn't fulfill all those requirements, he's someone else. No, no, I, I know, no, I, I, I was, I was. My question was more related to the definite description. 
So is any is any possible that the definite description picks the same pairs in all possible worlds? I, I don't. I, I think I mean, possible it is. It, it would be a different. It would be a different uh, proposal. I, I think it's uh, it's always possible. I, I think it's more plausible that there are certain requirements for the name to refer, and the requirements that are put there in the Bible as very strict, like in order for this term to refer to that entity, you need to fulfill condition one, two, three, four, five, six, so there are several, it's a, it's a conjunction of, of conditions because when, when I'm claiming that those, those, the reference is indirect, is because it's mediated to all those conjunctions of descriptions that will only apply to a very specific entity. And so, so this, this is what I mean. So it would, it would be the, Please. The total opposite of what uh, uh, keeps saying, but again, it, it's not the total total opposite because I'm saying it varies from context to context. Some context, more ordinary context, Kripke's theory is going to make more sense. But I think when it comes to a highly meaningful concept, such as the concept of the Genesis or the concept of of the nation of Islam, when Malcolm X is is, is changing his name, I don't see uh, that uh, Kripke's theory. Uh, I don't see this. The, the, I don't see this theory making much sense of those those phenomena. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Great. Thank you. Uh, so we have another question from uh, Professor Adilso. If you want to. Thank you, Filippi, for your speech. Very interesting. Uh, interesting. You see uh, different names, especially in the uh, Genesis, in the Bible, describing situations, phenomena. And in this phenomenon, what do you think is possible uh, some uh, proper names describe psychology dispositions to what do you think about that? Well, interesting. Inter I mean, I never thought about it. I never thought about this, this hypothesis, I think. In the in the context of the Bible, and when it comes to to Abraham, Abraham, I, I'm assuming those are names of individuals. Those are names of full individuals, not merely their psychological dispositions. Um, but of course, proper names. Uh, the, the proper names is a is a hot topic within the analytic tradition, and of course, there are proper names that are not proper names of persons. But I'm only focusing on the name of proper, uh, on the on proper names of persons. You can use proper names for uh, for countries, right? So or streets, of psychological dispositions. But I don't know how my the theory that I'm proposing here would make sense of those cases. I would have to to think about it because uh, I might run into problems that I'm not thinking right right now. Do you have any particular text in mind in which uh, someone uses uh, a proper name? Uh, to 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 refer to a psychological disposition. No, no. I, I only uh, point this these questions because uh, my research about uh, psychological dispositions. Yes, for this reason, I I this is very interesting connections with my research about that. Okay. Ah, okay. Okay. Thanks. I, I mean, the, the connection that that I I wrote a lot about Nietzsche, uh, even though this paper is not a very Nietzschean paper. But the the core connection I see uh, between the things you were saying and my presentation is that the story of Abraham and the very reasons why uh, Yellowhin rebaptized Abraham into Abraham and Sarai into Sarah gives a lot of good arguments for Nietzsche, because the reason they they uh, admire, some, maybe admire is too strong, but the reason God rebaptizes them is because they follow the herd. They are the anti Nietzschean characters, because they are the ones who are giving up the, the urges, they are giving up the uh, what's more uh, body like about them, what's more irrational about them, in order to fulfill. God's will in order to, to to do for the sake of the community, right? So it's a it's a and of course this has a lot of implications when it comes to 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 the policies against um, so-called homosexuality. I don't even know if there is such a thing, but 
um, sexual practices that do not have as their core purposes reproduction. Because Abraham and Sarah, they are the standards, uh, the standard of a heterosexual relationship within the Christian tradition, according to which you need only to have sex to reproduce yourself. And so God is, is um, blessing them with a kid because they, they are for in Nietzschean terms, just because they are following the herd. Right? <laughs> so this, this would be the connection I, I, I see it. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Felipe. And any other question? I think we have uh, room for another question before going to the next uh, speaker. Any other question? Okay. So thanks again, Felipe.